the process may be hard at times, but the journey it is worth it. I am willing to fulfill your plans. I'm ascending to perfection. It's a new It's a new grace. It's a new face. These are different days. It's a new place you are taking me. It's a new together Wesley and Angela for many of those 25 years and it's all joy and to share this weekend with you has been a real pleasure for us. This weekend we have been looking at the theme looking back for forward momentum, looking back for forward momentum and on the journey, we have captured and developed the awesome power of momentum. And I know that's the heart 
of the leaders and saints of PLC to maintain and even increase momentum going forward. And so you are now looking back in order to increase that momentum going forward. Now, one of the driving forces behind our momentum is the involvement of the saints in the kingdom community of PLC in KCN Jamaica and also inside of the Congress prayer initiatives. When I spoke on Friday evening, I highlighted the issue of prayer and we dealt mainly with the issue of synchronization and alignment. And this morning we will be highlighting prayer as well. It's a very important and powerful and major issue inside of our kingdom communities. And so it is important we look at it going forward. And so my looking back for forward momentum, we are doing so in that beautiful and important area of prayer. <clears throat> in our looking back for forward momentum, we will do a cursory scan through some of these prayer initiatives that are pivotal to our journey. And I want to just remind us of some kingdom-based initiative in your KC there in Jamaica, Philadelphia Life Center. Now, prior to that name, we all know you were Northgate. And so Northgate Core team had a prayer initiative. And the team was divided into groups and the group members prayed and fasted each day of the week, except on Sundays. Powerful interaction. And you know, Dr. Woodruff reminded us about the prayer engine of the Congress. And we can see the prayer engine of Philadelphia Life Center inside of this initiative. Also, the core team, there is usually a half hour governmental prayer segment when the core team meets. And so we are highlighting a very pivotal aspect of community life, of the journey. And this is the area of prayer. And it was built very strongly inside of Philadelphia Life Center. At the KCN Jamaica level, members of Philadelphia Life Center and the other communities were divided into groups. And these groups met and prayed on a gender-based basis. Several of those groups are still meeting on a monthly basis even until this day. And I want to say special commendations to you because the prayer engine is very, very important that must be kept moving if we are to sustain our momentum forward. Then there was the Casey and Jamaica prayer day. And it was a day of worship and prayer conducted a few months before the transaction event way back there in 2012, the core global transaction event of our Congress in 2017. And I remember this so clearly, we had a Northern Caribbean governmental prayer initiative and that was held in April of 2017. And it was, here we see the theme. Here we are seeing some photos of Philadelphia Life Center during that prayer initiative. Are you seeing the photos?
See them. Okay. Intense words. Beautiful Philadelphia like center in action. And we're talking about prayer and the saints interacting and praying with each other. A beautiful, beautiful sight. And I just, we are looking back for forward momentum. Some of these little children must be much bigger now. And you know, Claudette, I didn't leave you out a couple of photos from a touch of love in that initiative as well. Praying in our governmental prayer of the Northern Caribbean in 2017. And then we have our Congress prayer initiatives. And I'm just taking us a cursory glance through. We would remember June of 2012 when we had the core global transaction event. And here we have the, 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 the PowerPoint, we have made the journey and we are here. That's June 2012. And I know Philadelphia Life Center participated and we prayed as one man and prayer like rolling thunder swept across the earth and penetrated deep into the spirit realm. Then in October of 20, 2016, there was the Congress Day of Fast, Prayer and Fasting, theme a call to reformation. And in that, it was a unique day for us as Congress WBN all across the earth when thousands of churches gathered together and stood in a day of prayer and fasting before the Lord, and this was done in preparation for the global governmental prayer event or the GGPE, which was held one week after in 2016. And we are just taking a scan of the prayer events because it's so important, such an important part of our development and our journey. The global governmental prayer event directed massive and aggressive prayer into the heavens to disrupt, destroy, and shatter strategic plans of the enemy and cause the satanic system to be unable to mobilize resources to impede the movement of the spirit to the end of time. And we all participated in that event. Then we can recall in October of 2019, the Global Day of Offering, the Global Day of Offering and how we prepared for that day. And in our communities, we had this exhibition of our journey then to 2016, to the Global Day of Offering. And of course, we fast forward to the Knox, and there was not number one in September of 2021, theme a shout from within the crisis. We were already in lockdown from the coronavirus crisis, the pandemic, and we had not number one in September of 2021. Inside of that knock, Dr. Woodruff in his presentation said something very interesting. And you know, it speaks also to the issue of momentum. And so I placed it here, Dr. Woodruff said, this knock is a proclamation that a muscular and a mature church is rising in the earth. Now we know that speaking of the body of Christ, but it's also speaking of of, 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 of Philadelphia Life Center. It's speaking of a touch of love. It's speaking of cutting edge. It's speaking of our different communities across the region and across the Congress. A muscular and mature church is arising in the earth to secure the name of the Lord and to fulfill his eternal plans. This not, not, not number one, 
indicates that from this point, there will be direct and aggressive momentum going forward without retreat and without any diminishing. And we know rather than things diminishing for us, it keeps increasing. And that's the kingdom principle because scripture teaches that the kingdom is ever increasing. Of the increase of its government, there will be no end. And so we are always in that upward trajectory. And during our review here in our 25th year and our celebrations of 25 beautiful years of journey, we are reviewing so that we can move forward aggressively after this weekend. Then we move to March 2021 of our knock number two, a holy cry from a global civilization. And then we had knock number three in December of 2021. And we know Dr. Woodruff has already announced knock number four, and we are in preparation mode for knock number four, which is the harvest knock. A beautiful journey with, and you know, these are just prayer initiatives at a kingdom community level, at the KCN level, and at the Congress level. And I know we have been praying much inside of our families. We have been praying much within our people groups. We have been praying even our, as individuals, and ever so often, Dr. Woodruff would admonish us to offer up our prayers, our prayers, and we are always praying. And of course, we recently, Dr. Woodruff shared with us that our prayers, you know, it goes up as dense incense and fill the atmosphere in the heavenly realm. And we will continue to do so and we are highlighting this aspect of our journey. Dr. Woodruff, he often repeats this phrase, it is the power of the journey that has forged us and made us strong. It is the power of the journey that has forged us and made us strong. In knock number three, the saints of the Congress filled the atmosphere around the heaven, lift on with a dense and a holy smoke and fragrance. Now coming out of knock number three, the Lord spoke to Precision Center, that's my kingdom community. The Lord spoke to us a very simple yet profound word that we have been unpacking as part of our community emphasis. And it was 2022, the year of persistence and insistence. And of course, this is in the context of prayer. And I am sharing with you this morning some of the things that he spoke to us about. And so we will be talking about persistence and insistence prayer nuggets. Some nuggets, important pointers that we need to carry with us during our journey to knock number two, during in gathering and whatever takes place beyond in our Congress. We will be persistent and insistent, and we will be looking at some of the prayer nuggets of persistence and insistence. And the first nugget that I would like to leave with you is always pray and never give up. Nugget number one, always pray and never give up. In Luke chapter 18, it was Jesus speaking to his disciples. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. One day, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they always, they should always pray and never give up. This is Jesus 
sharing with his disciples. And he wanted to communicate a very important message, which is one of our nuggets today. You should always pray and never give up. And in order to communicate that principle, that nugget, he went into a story. And this is the story. There was a judge in a certain city. He said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. Why? She is persistent. She's not giving in. This is what he said. This woman is driving me crazy and I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant request. This is Jesus sharing this story with the disciples wanting to emphasize how important it is to always pray and never give up. And he's trying to say to them, you do the same thing to God. Jive God crazy. Wear God down. And I want us to be doing that inside of Philadelphia Life Center, inside of the people groups, inside of the growth groups, inside of the families, each individual, we are going to insist and persist in our prayers, driving God crazy or wearing him down until he responds. Verse six, the Lord, after telling the story, now he said to them, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even the unjust judge rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think your God, Philadelphia Life Center, an unjust judge rendered a just decision because the woman was driving him crazy, the woman was wearing him out, the woman persisted and she insisted that she received justice. And God, Jesus is saying to the disciples, don't you think that your God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? And he said, I tell you, he will grant you justice quickly. And I want us to hear this this morning. Whatever you're going to God about, as a community, your people groups, as individuals, as families, keep on persisting and insisting. He will grant justice quickly. We are doing it at the Congress level. That's why we keep knocking and knocking and knocking. We are going to wear him out knowing he will grant us justice quickly. Nugget number two, your transactions with God behind the scenes secure the future of your loved ones. And you know, this was one of the things that really came home to me very strongly in knock number three. In knock number three, as we spoke about in gathering, and as Dr. Woodruff spoke about the issue of the judgment, and we start calling forth judgment, the issue of the body of Christ coming to completion and all members who are a part of the body of Christ coming in, that really resonated in me. And more so, 
our of members of our families, members of you know, friends, co-workers, and others who are a part of the body of Christ, but they have not yet come in. And I'm sure many of us this morning in this session, dear persons whom you have been praying over, dear persons whom you're concerned about because you, and these persons are your siblings, these persons may be your children, these persons may be other family members, friends, co-workers, you name it. These persons, you are fully convinced that they are part of the body of Christ, even though they have not yet made a, a, a decision or they have made a decision, but they, are sla they have slackened up and you are in there praying for them. And so your prayers, your transaction or your prayers with God behind the scenes will secure the future of your loved ones. And we want to look at Abraham and Lot this morning to, to highlight this nugget. This is Luke chapter 17, and it's Jesus once again speaking. In Luke chapter 17, verses 28 and 29, from the New King James Version, Jesus says, as it was also in the days of Lot, we know he was he spoke of the days of of, 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 of of the days of Moses, but he's also the days of Noah, but he's now speaking of the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, you know, life as usual. But on the day that Lot went out, notice that on the day that Lot went out, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. And we are told we are living in those days as it was then, so will it be. And it was on the day that Lot went out that fire and brimstone rained down. Now it was Abraham's transaction with God behind the scenes that secured the exit of Lot and his family. Look at Genesis chapter 19, verses 27 to 29. Abraham, we know he had an interaction with God. God was on his way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But before doing so, he had a conversation with Abraham. And Abraham persisted and insisted that God could not destroy the righteous with the wicked. And he wanted to ensure that his family members down in Sodom were not destroyed. And he spoke to God and he was able, he insisted and brought it down from 50 to 10. We know the story quite well. And after he brought it down to 10, he left. And we get to now verse 27. The morning after, Abraham got up early and hurried out to the place where he had stood in the Lord's presence. He looked out across the plain towards Sodom and Gomorrah and watched as columns of smoke rose from the cities like smoke from a furnace. Look at verse 29, a beautiful verse. It says, but God had listened to Abraham's request and kept Lot safe. Let me repeat that. But God had listened to Abraham's request and kept Lot safe, removing him from the disaster that engulfed the cities on the plain. Abraham interacted with God. He persisted, he insisted, and in his persistence and his insistence, that kept Lot saved. You know, you can put your name there. God listened to Wesley and heard his request and kept the people he's praying for safe. God listened to Claudette 
God listen to the different members of the community, whoever you are and whoever you are praying for inside of your family. We are talking in this, in this nugget of our families, of you know, whether parents praying for children, whether it's for our brothers and our sisters, cousins, you name it, or family members, friends, co-workers, persons who, you know, they're in your heart, you carry them, you carry them and you are praying for them just as Abraham, as we persist and insist, God is listening. God had listened to Abraham's request and kept Lot safe, removing him from the disaster that engulfed the cities of the plague. So a question to us this morning, how many of our family members, loved ones, friends, whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life are still trapped in the Babylonian system. Our prayers behind the scenes will secure their release, will save them. Our persistent request will remove them from the pending judgment and keep them safe. Just as Abraham, our hearts are burdened for them and we will work behind the scenes to release them and set them free so they take their place within the body of Christ and serve the Lord. Our prayers behind the scenes. You know, you know, Jesus spoke about that to his disciples as well. He said, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. You know, you just shut your door. And when the door is shut, pray to your father in secret. And your father who hears in secret will reward you openly. And that's what we see with Abraham. He interacted just him and God alone. But God rewarded him openly and saved Lot. Our family members, you name them, they too must get out before the judgment falls. But I want to spend a few minutes to look at the starting point of Lot issues. Because we are told as it was in the days of Lot, so will it be. And some of us may end up in that Lot situation that the prayers of others that may snatch you out. And we do not want that to be so. It was so for a lot. And this is the reason. Genesis 13 verse 12 tells us, Abraham lived in the land of Canaan. Here we knew the situation quite well. Abraham and Lot were together. The Lord was blessing them and the blessings made it, made it impossible for them to live together. And so Gabriel said, let's separate. And in the separation, Lot chose, you know, chose the Sodom and Gomorrah, the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. And here we see Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. He pitched his tents near Sodom. Look at verse 13. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. And so he pitched his tent close to the wickedness. He pitched his tent close to Babylon. He pitched his tent. And this morning, we will not pitch our tent near the darkness. Come on, we will not pitch our tent near the darkness. This action by Lord placed him and his family in the pathway towards the judgment of God. He pitched his tent near the wickedness and the darkness of Sodom. He pitched his tent near the wickedness and darkness of Sodom. The thing about it here in Genesis chapter 14, we see not he pitched, it started out with his him pitching his tent near, but notice here there was a war between kings, four kings against five kings. And Lot was with the group from the king with the king of Sodom. And here we are told at verse, in verse 12 
that these kings took away Abraham's nephew Lot and his possession while he was living in Sodom. He started out by pitching his tent near. Now we see him living in Sodom. You see, he had the wrong focus at the time of impending and imminent danger. And I want to say to us this morning, saints of Philadelphia Life Center, of A Touch of Love Ministries, and all those here this morning, do not pitch your tent near Sodom. Do not pitch your tent near education. Do not pitch your tent near economics. Do not pitch your tent near, near, near status and these things. Yes, they are important, but you pitch your tent inside of the kingdom and kingdom positions. Jesus told the disciples that all these things, the nations of the earth seek after, the fame, the fortune, the status, the education, and these things. And your heavenly father knows that you have need of them. But if you pitch your tent near the kingdom of God or in the kingdom of God and righteousness, these things will be added unto you. So you don't go after those things. You go after the kingdom positions. And as you do that, these things will be added. Lord should have pitched his tent near the purposes of God and the other things would have been added to him. And so word to our young parents, especially our young Hebronites, pay close attention to where you pitch your tent. Very important, that was the, the issue that placed Lot, a righteous man. We are told he was a righteous man, but his righteous soul was vexed from day to day. Why? He's inside of the mess and he saw the wickedness of the people and it affected him. We will be in the world, but not of the world. Our address is the kingdom and we are not moved or we are not pitching our tent anything close of the kingdom of God. So pitch your tent to ensure, and we are speaking to our young Hebronites, pitch your tent to ensure that your children are protected and shielded from the darkness of Babylon. Lot did not do that. He pitched his tent near Sodom. He then ended up living in Sodom. And of course, we saw what happened to him, his wife, and his children. Amazing. It all started with where he pitched his tent. That thing deep in his heart that moved him and sustained him. And so I am encouraging you, pitch your tent to ensure your children are protected and shielded from the darkness of Babylon. Pitch your tent to ensure that they will never be in the path of the judgment of God. Pitch your tent to ensure they have a great appreciation for the word of the Lord, worship and prayer. Abraham was very persistent and insistent in securing Lot and his family. And that's what we are doing as well in this season. And as we go forth, they will do so with momentum. You could read Genesis 18, 20 to 33, when Abraham was negotiating with God. And it is that time interacting with God, he persisted and he insisted the righteous will not be destroyed with the wicked. And he saved Lot. Nugget number three. Our prayers ascend as a memorial to God. Come on, you are praying. And Philadelphia Life Center, I know you have been praying and you will be praying more. Wesley, I know you are praying. I know your love and your care for the pastors inside of Jamaica. 
and inside of those islands that you 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 facilitate the work of the congress i know what's in your heart brother let me say to you your prayers are ascending to god as a memorial ascending as a memorial and i want all of us to understand this this morning and really persist and insist, have that increased momentum in the area of prayer going forward, because as we pray, our prayers ascend as a memorial unto God, a memorial offering before the Lord. It was the persistent prayers of a Roman centurion soldier. This guy was not a Jew. He was not a believer. But he persisted in prayer, and it, is what, it was his persistent prayer that activated the necessary partnership with God to earth his divine purpose for the Gentiles. Actually, it was the prayer of this guy why we are in. Because as we know, we are not born Jews, and so normally we would not be in. But then this centurion soldier, he persisted. And we'll be looking at, at, in, at it in a moment. The Gentiles were given full access as members of the body of Christ. They received the salvation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let's turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts is here. There was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, it what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family, this guy is a Ebonite, he and all his family were the devout and God fearing. He also gave generously to those in need and he prayed to God regularly. One day, he persisted, and one day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Isn't this beautiful? Your, this is a young man, a Gentile, but something in him was activated before God and towards God. And so he prayed regularly. He was persistent. And in his persistence, one day something happened. An angel, an angel presented himself. And the angel told him, your prayers and your gifts have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now memorial speaks to a reminder, a record. So every time this guy prayed, a record was built. There was something that caused God to think about what he has said, caused God to remember. And that memorial was built. I want us building memorials inside of PLC as a community. I want the people groups and the growth groups to be building memorials before God. So that at every turn, God is seeing that monument, that memorial built. Cornelius persistent prayers and gifts to the poor constructed a monument before God which served as a constant reminder that a positive response was necessary. And that's what we are doing. That's what we are doing in the knots. 
and we have not number one, not number two, not number three, and we are going back with not number four, and we will build such a massive memorial that nothing is in the mind of God more than to respond. And he already said he is not unjust. He already told us that he will respond speedily. And so we continue to build memorials. And this is the response, the divine response, God. The angel told him, the Lord says, send men to Joppa to bring back a man by the name of Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. Do you see the details? And all this is because a Gentile man built a memorial before God. A Gentile man was persistent in his prayers, always praying and never giving up. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. And he told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Now look what's happening here. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. This is not coincidence. This is all happening as a result of this guy's persistence and insistence. That he persisted and that God dispatched an angel to speak to him. The angel gave him the message and he now sent two of his men. And while they were on their way, at the same time, God was working on the other side, preparing Peter to receive them. Because we know Peter was a Jew and that hegemon was there that Jews do not interact by law with Gentiles. Amazing all that came out of one man's persistent prayer. Peter is an apostle, but he is an apostle with a bias towards the Gentiles. And this man's prayer broke down all of that. So Peter was in the roof way. He became hungry and went, wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell in a chance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheep being let down to the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat the voice. And this whole episode is seeking to dismantle Peter's, you know, bias towards the Gentiles so he will be able to go and interact. It's amazing all this because of the persistence of one man. A Gentile centurion. So Peter, of course, he said, surely, Lord, you know, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice said to him a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. And immediately, the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. Do you see the length God is going to have the message coming to the Gentiles? Because there was one man persisting and insisting in his prayers. I'm hoping that we don't have any little biases that God is seeking to dismantle so that we can open the way and the path for persons to come in. Family members, let there be no bias. Let us be open and understand they are all God's creation. 
no matter who they are, they too are to be in the kingdom. And so Peter went down. The man says to Peter, we have come from Cornelius, the centurion. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guest. The next day, Peter started out with them and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expected, was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reference, but Peter made him get up, stand up. He said, I'm only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you're well aware. <laughs> you are well aware that it is against our law. See what God had to break down and dismantle. But all this, let's not lose sight of that. All this activated by a, a Roman centurion who persistently prayed. Here they're saying, Jew Gentiles are not to enter in. He knew he was a Gentile and he persisted. And one day, one day, in his persistence, God answered speedily. And not only did God answer, God is now dismantling. And this is an apostle of God. This is a man who walked with Jesus, interacted with Jesus, yet he had this thing that he held on to, which was just Jewish. And God said, let me dismantle it. And he's now explaining, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. That's the Jewish law, but not God's law. And so he said, but God has shown me that I should not call any man, any man impure or unclean. Do not look down on anyone. Don't look down on anyone. So when I was sent for, I came without raising objection. He couldn't object any longer. May I ask why you sent for me? And of course, Pete Simon explained. And his explanation leads us to nugget number four. Our prayers activate the suddenly reality. And Dr. Woodruff taught us about the suddenly reality in the ABR process. The suddenly reality. Look at what Cornelius said four days ago. I was in my house praying at this hour, at three in the afternoon. And suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer. And God remembered, do you remember that memorial gift? He remembered your gifts to the poor. So the suddenly reality, extracts from the ABR part one, when the usual order of things is disrupted by massive intrusion from another dimension, causing the flow of time to shift and change. That what took place. And we are expecting the suddenly reality as we move forward with momentum, as we continue to pray, we are expecting suddenly reality to interject and to cause the disruption of a massive intrusion into the normal flow of things. Dr. Woodruff went on every time suddenly occurs, the normal flow of time, events, and reality are severely disrupted, and we move to the new expectation and a new excellent plate. He also said suddenly breaks 
the laws that locks our mind into the dominating sequence of the earth. That's what Peter experienced. That sudden reality, it unlocked his mind from that frequency of the earth which says the Jews do not interact or visit Gentiles. Look at Peter. We saw it in verse 28. You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But the suddenly reality broke that law. In Acts 15, 1 to 5, and we know that, sorry, Acts 11, 1 to 5, the apostles and brothers of Judah had heard that the Gentiles also had received the word. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him. They were holding on, and Peter had to explain to them what happened. Do you see they're highlighting the law? You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it happened. And this is what Peter said after he explained it. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God. When they heard this, they had no further objections and they too praised the Lord. So then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. And the activating power of all of this, a Gentile, a Roman centurion, who he and his family persisted in prayer before God. Nugget number five, our prayers are treated equally by God. He shows no favoritism. Let me repeat this, because this speaks to many of us. Sometimes we think that only certain people have direct route to God or he listens more and listens keenly to some and not to others. Let me tell you, this was a powerful revelation for Peter that God shows no favoritism. He treats everyone equal. This is what Peter said. I now realize how true it is. So this was a saying he knew, but then his religious and Jewish culture, he couldn't fathom it. But after going through this experience, he said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. Let me say to us this morning, God shows no favoritism, none. They're not, you know, I'm sure there are some persons who, you know, like in Christian Center, there are some guys who, man, when they pray, people think that, oh my, they have direct access to God. And so they're intimidated by it. I'm sure it's so in different communities. I don't think Precision Center is unique. And they believe that, you know, and we, some of us grew up in that environment. I grew up in an environment that, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the morning worship service, if they used to refer to it as the divine worship service. And inside of that service, only certain people could be called on to pray. And I'm telling you, when they, I remember when they started calling on me to pray. Man, something in me said, you have arrived. What craziness. And of course, I'm sure some of you listening were inside of situations like that. That only the who is who. 
given position, given opportunity. Well, it's not so in the kingdom. God shows no favoritism. And we know in our Congress, everything Dr. Woodruff is always saying it is the saints. The saints carry the load. Nothing moves without the saints. And in every knock, there are segments where the saints, the saints. And in knock number four, it will be no different. All the saints. And I want all, every saint, no matter who you are, no matter what you have been told, dismantle everything this morning and understand that you are as important to God as Wesley Boyan is, as Dr. Noel Woodbrook is, as any one of us. Let me tell you, he shows no favoritism, no favorites. No, none more special. He will do it to everyone, to everyone. I want this to really be something of encouragement to those of you who always want to stay in the background and feel as though, oh, it doesn't. No, let me tell you, you are a part of the body and each part must do its share. That's what Ephesians 4, 16 tells us. That as each part does its own special work, it causes the body to grow. So each part, each member has a special work. Understand that. Now the work may not be what Wesley does. It may not be what someone else is doing but it is a special work. It is as special as what Wesley does. I want us to understand this. So if you call it menial, you see, it's because in the world, they have built a system which seeks to highlight and magnify some above others. And that thing has, set, has crept into the church. That's why we do not do it in the Congress. So in the church, man, you have these men who are apostles and, and of course they're calling them apostles so-and-so and prophets so-and-so and ministers so-and-so. But then you have a grave digger in your, in your church and why don't you say grave digger so-and-so? That will never be done because that's the meaning. No, nothing is the meaning in the sight of God. All are important and necessary and valuable. I remember one time in Antigua, there was a there was a strike. The the the, the these guys, you know, the, the 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 correct name isn't coming to me, but I'll just use what we normally say: the the garbage collectors. They see that I they have a nice, beautiful name, something technician. But we refer to them as garbage collectors in a derogatory manner. And they, they had a strike in Antigua. And during the strike, they were on the way, the radio and television, telling people how important and valuable they are. Because if that strike were to go on for two weeks, come on, do you know what would happen to, 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 the, to the nation? And we see that, and it spoke, Paul spoke about it with the body as well, that no part is less than the other. If the eye were to say, because I'm not the hand, I have no need of the no, we are all important, no favorites. But in every nation, God accepts men who fear him and do what is right. Fear the Lord and do what is right. You are accepted and you are as legitimate as anyone else. The same situation in Acts 15 when the church, when, when the saints, you can recall that story quite well. Paul and a few of the guys went down to the Gentiles and they preached Christ and significant things took place. And because of that, the, 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 uh, the circumcised Jews were having difficulties 
And so they call this special council meeting in Acts chapter 15. And they came to that meeting. And of course, Paul and guy, the guys spoke. Some others spoke. Then Peter said, God who knows the heart shows, showed that he accepted the Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them for he purified their hearts by faith. And Peter, it's always Peter. Listen to Peter again in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. Remember that the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. Remember the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge you or he will reward you according to what you do. And so what we are going to do, we are going to live in reverent fear during our time as foreigners here on earth. He shows no favorites. And here is John. John is saying, we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And since we know he hears us, when we make our requests, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. So we'll ensure that we, everything is according to his will. Everything pleases him and we know it will be done. He shows no favorites. And nugget number six, our righteous lifestyle make our prayers powerful and successful. It's the way we live. He shows no favorites. But once we live righteously before him, our prayers are powerful and successful. In James chapter 5, starting at verse 16, James says, the prayer of a righteous man, and you can place your name here, the prayer of a righteous man, the message Bible says a person living right is powerful and effective. Then he went in to, to show this with one of the righteous men, Elijah. And he said, Elijah was a man just like us. He was no superhuman. He was not afraid. He was a man just like you and I. These things should really build our faith and our confidence in God. These things should assist us in seeing ourselves correctly before him. Because Elijah, when we go to heaven and we see these guys, when they know we are not going to have our earthly mentality, but if we had our earthly mentality, I'm telling you, we would all be surprised and shocked because they're going to be ordinary men, just like you and I, ordinary people. See, Babylon built up these things and we have, you know, been overcome by them. But God is seeking to dismantle it so that we see ourselves correctly and each one of us play our part. And he's saying, Elijah was a man just like us. Where is he? He was a righteous man just like us as well. And so he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And what happened? It did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed. And guess what? The heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crop. A man just like us, but he was righteous. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, we read that story of Elijah when he prayed. And the beautiful thing about it is that Elijah took up a, pos a posture in the earth. He bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. And he sent his servant and he told his servant, go and look out toward the sea. The servant went and looked. 
Then they turned to Elijah and said, I didn't see anything. But Elijah sent him back and seven times he said, go and look. Do you see the persistence coming through? And Elijah persisted. Time number one, the guy went, looked, nothing happened. Elijah said, go back again. And he kept praying. Time number two, he went out, he returned, nothing happened. Elijah told him, go back and look again. And he kept praying. He persisted. And guess what? Finally, the seventh time, when the guy came, he said, I saw a little cloud, a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. And that was the cue Elijah needed, the physical evidence he needed that just what he declared was happening because he persisted and he insisted. But the thing that made that possible for Elijah was his righteous lifestyle. And I want to say to every one of us this morning, live a righteous life before God, a life that is aligned to his purposes, aligned to his requirements, a life that is perpendicular. And we do that. And these nuggets, we carry them with us and we continue. We go into knock number four, and we pray knowing, knowing that he hears us. We pray in knock number four and beyond, and we continue, and we'll be praying for those of our relatives who have not yet come in. They have not yet, but we know they've got to be in. Our praise behind the scene, our praise behind the scene. Uh, bringing them in. And so those are the six nuggets. We spent the time this morning just looking back at the prayer initiatives and I couldn't highlight all. I highlighted some from the Kingdom Community Philadelphia Life Center. And I commend you, commend you. You're doing a great and awesome, a wonderful job. We looked at some of the prayer initiatives at the KCN level in Jamaica and the Northern Caribbean. Then we looked at the global prayer initiatives of our Congress and we are praying, we are praying. Then we highlighted some nuggets. Always pray, never give up. Know that your prayers in the background, in secret, you're carrying these people in your heart and you're constantly and persistently reaching out on the every half. Know and understand God is hearing your prayers. And the Father who is in secret will reward you openly. We are told Lot was kept safe because God answered Abraham's prayer. We saw a centurion soldier building memorials as he prayed persistently to God. And think something that should not have happened, happened. And I say should not in the context of the Jewish community. They felt this could never happen, but it happened because this guy was persistent. This guy persisted. We looked at the suddenly reality or prayers activate the sudden reality. And I'm sure many of us have experienced that sudden reality in response to our prayers. These things work. No favorites, no favorites. You play your part and live righteous lives. Father, we give you thanks this morning. Thank you for Philadelphia Life Center and the journey. Thank you for Wesley Boyens, a young man who grew up in Trinidad, 
But Father, you took him over to Jamaica and he carries Jamaica in his heart even more than he carries his homeland. He carries the people. I know it. We have had many discussions. We know how he carries the body of Christ, not just Philadelphia Life Center. Yes, that's the dimension of the body of Christ that you're giving him to give direct oversight. But Father, he carries the entire body of Christ in his heart. We know how his heart yearns and groans over the pastors in that nation and how he wishes that their eyes will be open, they would see and understand where God is and what God is doing and migrate to it. We know the prayers of his heart. We know it, Father, and we know that you have been hearing it and we give you thanks. We know as he continues, you will continue to open the door for him. And so we thank you for Wesley and for Angela. We thank you for the faithfulness as faithful stewards to you. We give you thanks. We thank you for Philadelphia Life Center, a beautiful community, great people, saints that I have grown to love deeply, to love deeply. We thank you for them, the elders, the core team members, all the saints of that beautiful community. We bring them to you today as we celebrate 25 years of journey, 25 beautiful years. There have been many points on that journey. Some were very difficult, very difficult, but Father, you were with them and you sustained them and you kept them safe. And we say thanks to you. Today we bless your name and we honor you. We thank you, Father, for the powerful prayer engine in, inside of this community. And Father, even as you speak more in that area to really strengthen for them to go forward, we pray that all will come on board. Understanding we all have a part to play to make this place dense with smoke. We thank you. We bless you. Thank you for a beautiful weekend. Thursday evening, Friday evening, Saturday morning, Saturday evening, this morning, and this afternoon, the final moments of celebration. And Father, let them experience many sudden realities going forward. We bless you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.